have a Bible, please make use of the one in the chair in front of you. And you'll find this on page number nine of that Bible. We, we also want to extend the opportunity to you to give you a Bible. If you don't own one, it'd be a joy to give you a copy of God's Word. And uh, so please uh, see me at the guest reception tent when you leave today or any of the pastors and we will get you a copy of a Bible. Well, folks, before I read the scripture, I just have to tell you, you know, in the life of a church, there are always seasons. There are mountain peaks and there's a lot of uh, plains and then there's some valleys. It, it's like life. There, there are ups and downs, but I can't help but thank the Lord publicly for the evidences of his grace and his work that I'm getting to watch right now in the life of our church. Uh, Wednesday evening, as I was winding things down here and getting ready to leave, the band was still in here practicing. Um, I went outside and kind of made my way around the back, and three of our adults were around back in a conversation with a young man uh, sharing the gospel. And I just got to walk up on it and listen and be a part of it. Uh, just a, a very simple clarification, explanation of what it means to know and love and follow Jesus. That's just powerful to watch. And it wasn't like, well, Chuck's here, so he, he should take over it. I, I did share some in the conversation, but to, to just watch that. And I know that's just something I got to walk up on. I know in other ways, you're serving the Lord. You're making Christ known. I heard this morning, yesterday at the um, outreach in the city of Griffin, where we have some folks go, and they have a prayer tent. I heard this morning there were two people led to faith in Christ yesterday at that prayer tent. So I, I was just so encouraged to hear that and just bless the Lord publicly for his goodness and should humble us. It should lead us to pray. It should lead us to uh, continue to call on the Lord and worship him for so many reasons. Well, our text is Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to pick up in verse number 10, Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 10. I'm going to read through the end of the chapter. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him. And they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. The word of the Lord. May we pray together. Father, as we continue to work our way in the book of Genesis, we readily confess that we come to some passages that we 
find initially difficult to understand. And yet, Lord, at the same time, we know that every word of Scripture is written for our good, for our instruction, for building up your people in righteousness, for calling those who do not know you as Savior and Lord to the one true King of the universe. Now, Lord, as we look at this passage this morning and as I try to explain the meaning of this, I pray for you to enable me to preach this morning. Lord, I pray that you would open the hearts and ears of your people to the truth of your word. And God, as we come to the preaching of the word, I know that some are in difficult places this morning. For some, Lord, it's, it, it, it may seem impossible to even listen. Father, I know some are uh, in a valley. Some are dealing with some very stressful, hard situations in homes or in their places of work. Lord, would you bring comfort as only you can? God, some are going to find it difficult to listen because they're losing their way spiritually, Lord. They've, they've begun to drift. Maybe for some, the world has become a huge enticement. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will work to call him, call her back to the true center, to the cross, back to what really matters in life. Father, some are on a mountain peak of joy. Life is good. I just rejoice with those that are rejoicing and thank you that they're in a a sweet and good place in their life, Lord. May, may you just encourage them to enjoy this season and as they're there to remember those that are maybe not exactly where they are. And Lord, now we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will do what only you can do and that you will speak your truth into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the reasons that I believe in the trustworthiness of the Bible, and there are many reasons, you can read whole books on apologetics, that it's a big fancy word that just means defending the faith, whole sections on the trustworthiness of the Bible, but one of the reasons I believe the Bible is God's word is that it does not cover up the failures of its heroes. If you think about that, the, the characters of the Bible, those that are elevated, those that are prominent, they all had failures. We're going to see some of Abram's failures. We're going to see one this morning. David had his failures in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Simon Peter did. In fact, all the apostles did. And so nowhere does the Bible seek to cover up the failures of its heroes. And Abram, as I said, is a classic example. We tend to think of Abram as a man that had unshakable faith, and he had great faith. There's no doubt the faith of Abraham was great, but he also had his moments. He had his weaknesses. And the events in the second part of Genesis chapter 12 are going to show us the, the need in our own lives to keep running to Jesus as we were singing a moment ago. Yes, I'm running, and we have to keep running. We have to keep believing that, uh, not to try to go back through all the songs, but that song we were singing a moment ago, that he will hold me fast. So I want to talk this morning, I want to share a message from the second part of Genesis 12, the text I read, about our frail faith and our faithful God. Our frail or weak faith and our faithful God. Last Sunday, we, we saw strong faith in Abram. We saw how he trusted God when he left Ur and he made his way to Canaan. And how once he arrived there, he, 
He built an altar and he worshiped God in a, a pagan land. And so without question, we could say that Abram had a great beginning. So that's the first big idea that I want to just kind of help us, if I could say it this way, Velcro to our hearts. Abram had a great beginning. He, he trusted God. That was a big step to leave her. It was another big step to leave Haran. It was another big step of faith once he arrived in Canaan and he saw all of the idolatry surrounded by gods and goddesses to build an altar and worship God. So he had, no doubt, a great beginning. He acted courageously in many ways. There, there certainly had to be questions for him. I, I mean, if God spoke to you and said, leave your homeland and go somewhere else in the world, I, I'm thinking most of us would, would question God a little bit on that. So I, don't, I, I can't say something the text does not say, but you have to wonder, knowing that he was made of flesh as we are, did he not have some questions that he would have asked of the Lord? The text doesn't record it, but he went out on faith. And every Christian, every person in this room, every person listening who is a Christian started out initially on this journey by faith in Christ. That's the that's how you become a Christian. That's the gospel. That's the heart of the gospel. That's the beginning of the gospel. That, that message of the Bible, that good news that the Bible tells us from beginning to end in different ways that the one true God, the just create, creator of the universe, the gracious, good creator of the universe, that that God looked down upon hopelessly sinful men and women like us, that he demonstrated his mercy and his kindness and his grace by sending his son, who is God in the flesh, who came to earth, who lived the life that none of us have lived or can live or ever will live. On the cross, he bore the wrath of the Father that we deserved. He was buried. He was raised from the grave. And all who look away from themselves and look to Jesus and rely on him, can and will be saved, reconciled to God forever. That's the heart of the gospel. And that's how the, the life of faith begins. It's not complicated. It's not how much you know. It's not how much you remember. It, it, it's not that you have the path all understood. You, you recognize and admit that you're a sinner that you've sinned against a holy and just God. You believe that Christ died for you. You confess that he is Savior, that he is Lord, that he's the only way to heaven. And you declare him. You begin to follow him. That's just the heart of the gospel. But I wonder, and this gets into our text this morning more so, if I'm speaking to someone like Abram and you had a great beginning, what I just told you about the gospel, you said, I believe that, I believed that, I am believing that. You had a great beginning. And if so, in the privacy of your thoughts, I, I want to just urge you to go back to that beginning. For some of you, that's the earliest days of your childhood. Go back to the beginning of your faith. Maybe it was being nurtured from your youngest days in a Christian home. I know that's not everyone. But if that's your story, go back to those beginning days of faith. You can see that, that childhood church. You, you remember mom and dad, many of you do, who faithfully loved and served and followed Jesus. Church was not a, a, a question on Saturday night or Sunday and Unless you were on vacation or uh, there was some good reason, it was just, it was kind of like school on Monday morning. You were going. Others came to Christ later in life. You, what I just described, you said, man, I, I wish that had been my story. I, I might could have been spared a lot of heartache and problems, but that, that's not so much my story. I, I came to faith later in life. But still, you had a good beginning, a great beginning. You, you heard the gospel and you believed, 
and there were those early days of joy and excitement, I just want you to go back and hold on to that for a moment. And I'm going to, throughout this sermon, pivot back and forth between that beginning, whenever that was for you, that beginning of faith, and the story of Abram in this chapter. So hold on to that memory, and let's go back to Abram, the, the man who had a great beginning, but also the man who trusted God in Ur and in Canaan is now going to face a difficult crisis. He's going to face something that's really, really hard. And our text mentions it. I've read it, chapter 12, verse 10. The word famine appears twice. It's a terrible word. It's a terrible thing to happen. Now, I don't know this for fact. Maybe you've lived outside of the United States and you lived in a famine. But I would think most people in this room, including me, knows nothing about the horrific, um, how, how horrible it would be to be in a place where there's no food. People die during famines. Uh, children's stomachs are bloated. It's a, it's a terrible thing. Death is inevitable when, when food runs out, and particularly when water is scarce, death can come soon. Uh, starvation is, is more than just something people say, oh, I'm starving. People are starving. They're literally starving, and they're dying. So it seems that Abram is in a place where he's got to do something. Or does he? Now, we, we could debate that. He, but it seems he's at a fork in the road. He, he looks around at Sarai. He, he looks at Lot. He looks at those people that are around him. Starvation is, is a real possibility. He's in a crisis. So the question is, what is Abram going to do? Is he going to trust God or is he going to take matters into his own hands? Now, from his point of view, and I dare say if we were there, we would have felt the same way. Going somewhere where there was likely going to be water, certainly there is, the, the Nile River running through Egypt, the proximity of the Red Sea, there's, there's, there's going to be uh, food because there's corn in abundance. It, it would seem like this is the most logical thing to do. And, and life would definitely improve there, or would it? Maybe it won't. The famine, in reality, could have been a season, could have been a moment in Abram's life where he would learn to trust God. And this is going to sound like, wow, you're really going to great lengths to defend Abram. I'm just trying to make this as real as I can. I'm, I'm trying to picture me in, in Canaan where there's a famine and a family that's with me that I love. Would I trust God in that moment or would I be looking for a, a way to take matters into my own hands? So in his defense, he did not have the benefit of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. He didn't have the benefit of, of all the verses of the Bible that we know and all the teachings that we've heard. All this man had was a man that grew up in paganism in Ur, and he hears God call him to pack up and leave, and he goes. And he obeys God, and shortly after he gets in a pagan land and begins to worship God, a terrible famine comes. And so he's in a difficult crisis. And friends, I just want to tell you, and maybe this is not news, probably isn't news to you if you've walked with the Lord for a long time, but God doesn't keep famines from our lives. There, there are different kinds of famines than... Uh, agricultural famines and God does not protect us from every single famine Th there are famines or we might say crisis in our crises in our families uh, crises come in different ways 
I may be speaking to someone in your marriage is in a crisis. There's a crisis at work. You've got a crisis with raising a, a, a child or a teenager. You may have a crisis with your adult parents. You're in a stage of life where it just feels like a crisis with your uh, aging mom or dad. There can be financial crises. And so here's, here's Abram. And so in famines, when he's in a famine, and if I just can pivot back to us in a moment, as we think about that great beginning or that initial beginning of our faith, we have a choice. Are we going to trust God or are we going to look to the world? So that's, I, want, I just want you to go back in your mind to yourself. Don't think about Abram for a moment. Abram chose not to trust God, or at least that it seems to be what, what Moses is communicating to the children of Israel as they're about to enter the promised land. For some reason, he's teaching them this lesson. He doesn't explicitly say it, but it seems pretty overwhelming that's what's going on, that he's not trusting God. So I'm just asking you, and you don't, don't need to raise your hand or... This is just something you answer in your own heart and mind. If you chose, if there's been a time in your life that you've chosen to leave God out of your life, out of your life's plans, how did that work out for you? You had a great beginning, but somewhere along the way, you chose to take matters into your own hands. It may have been a crisis. It may have been something hard in your life, and you just said, I, I, I don't know about God right now. I just know I've got to figure this out. So if that's what you did and you chose to take matters into your own hands, just for your own heart and your own head, answer that question. How is that working out? Is it working out well for you? I don't think too many people are going to say, you know, when I left God out of my life and I started running the show, things started to really get better. But there's other questions I, I wish you would just ponder, maybe a little bit of a different nuance to it. What tends to cause you to doubt God now? now again, this is just for you to answer. <clears throat> what tends to cause you to doubt God? What, what, for what reasons do you doubt yourself? You obeyed God, you trusted God, you set out on a journey, and now you're doubting yourself. Why do you do that? Maybe, maybe you don't know the answer. Let's go back to Abram. Apparently, it's obvious he looked at the world. There's no evidence in the passage I read that he sought God. He goes to Egypt. The Bible often associates going to Egypt with, for lack of a better way of saying it, a bad decision. It's not usually good in the Bible when people are in Egypt. Now, that's not saying that Egyptians today are uh, necessarily, that we think negatively we should want to take the gospel to all the ends of the earth, but generally when the Bible shows people moving or migrating toward Egypt, it's not going to have a good ending. I want you to hold your place in Genesis 12 and turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. It's on page 590 in the chair Bible. And I'd love for you to all see this in, in your copy of God's Word that just echoes this idea. Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 1. The idea that Egypt does not have a good ending. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. Ah, stubborn, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan but not mine, and who make an alliance but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. And watch this closely. Who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. It's not good, friends, when, when a hard time comes, when there's a crisis and we migrate away from God. We, we think that if we go to this Whatever that Egypt is, 
whatever our place is that we think, well, I'll, I'll go back to this. This is what I know. This is, this is where I'll get some answers. And verse 2 is, is pretty explicit. Those who go down to Egypt without asking for my direction that take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and don't seek shelter in the, sh and seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt, it's, it's not going to be good. The same thing comes out in chapter 31, uh, verse 1. You can read it on your own, the first couple of verses there if you want to just glance at it. It's more of, of looking for someplace else for might and power. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots, etc. It's the, it's the picture of looking for something strong, something powerful to hold me together in hard times. So Abram and Sarai get to Egypt. They believe their problems are going to disappear. They, they believe here's the answer, but problems just meet them. And so they, they begin to scheme, right? As they get there, you heard me as I read in the text, in the place where Abram thinks everything is going to work out and work for him, it works against him. How many times have we discovered that when we move away from the Lord and we migrate into the ways of the world that things don't work out? When we leave God out of the equation, our problems only get worse. I'm sure if we could just pull back the, the layers and all the, the trappings that we want to and not let ourselves be, our real self be seen with. If we're honest, and if we're real with one another, I, I believe most of us would be able to say, yep, what I thought was going to satisfy and be the answers uh, certainly did not supply. So here's, here's what Abraham's up against. He has an attractive wife. She is a beautiful woman. Now, she is, she is at this point in, in the scheme of ages then she's 65 years old but that that would be like a midlife for uh, for a person in that day and she's a woman beautiful in appearance the text is pretty explicit on that and he's a foreigner in Egypt Abram is he has no power there's no embassy that he can appeal to there's no passport that he can show and say I'm from the the mighty land of Ur or the land of Canaan he's at the mercy of the king and the Pharaoh is is a word for whomever the king happens to be so he's at the mercy of the king if the king wants to just take him out then he can easily do that so the scheme is put in place the, the deception is put in place just what is what going to do you're not my wife. I'm not your husband. We're brothers and sisters. And that way, everything is going to work out. Well, it doesn't work out. Somehow, the king learns of the deception. And again, he could have killed. He could have easily killed Abram. But God graciously protected him. It, it would appear that this king, who does not know God who does not believe in the one true God, rebuked a man who did believe. I want you to look at that in chapter 12 and verse 6, uh, 15. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and for her sake he dealt well with Abram. And then talks about the gifts he gave. Verse 17, the Lord afflicted Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And then the, the rage that seems to come over him. What is this you've done to me? So he begins to rebuke him. What have you, what have you done? This was serious business. Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? Henry Blackaby, I thought, had a great statement on this. He said, too often the world is wiser than God's people. You know what he meant by that? The world can be wiser than God's people. You know what he means? I, I think this is what he means, and I, I wish I could have um, asked him this question. I got to eat lunch with Henry Blackaby some years back, and if I'd have read that chapter of that book, 
I would have asked him that day. But I think this is what he means or meant by that statement. Let's just say that as a professing Christian, something in your lifestyle, your behavior, your language, your choices you're making, a non-believer, a person who is clearly not a follower of God, says something to you like this. I thought you were a Christian. How hard would that be for you to hear? I'm going to tell you, if you're a real Christian, that'd be terrible for somebody to say to you. If something's going on in your life and somebody that you know is not a Christian, that something in your life does not reflect God at all, and a non-believer says, aren't you a Christian? Or I thought you were a Christian. So that's, I think that's what Blackaby's point was there. The world is wiser than God's people are sometimes. Let's don't let that be so. Church, could I just admonish you? Could I give you a pastoral exhortation that we have a responsibility for brothers and sisters who are members of this church to lovingly but persistently when we know someone is going astray to try to bring them back. And, and sometimes that means that we have to, as some people say, sometimes after a sermon, I, I don't hear this every single week, but sometimes I'll hear somebody say, man, you are stepping on my toes today. That's a, a, just an old saying. I don't go around and go down and stomp on people's toes. Nobody would like that, but it's just an old way of saying that was getting kind of close. That's hitting hard. That's hitting right where I am. And, and so sometimes we have to step on people's toes. We have to love them enough as, part of this, as a part of this faith family to say, sister, brother, friend, it, it seems that you're drifting away from the Lord. Convince me otherwise, but, but your absence from the family of God or your, the choices that you're making, it seems that you're, in, you're not in a good place. Return to the Lord. We love you. We want to see you back in a good place and back in fellowship with the Lord. Too often the world is wiser. We watch people self-destruct when if we stepped in and said something, a life might be changed. So let's just pivot back and think of our own choices for a moment. I wonder if I speak to someone and, and you had a great beginning in faith. You had a great beginning until... Until you met her, or you met him, or you started hanging out with them. And that great beginning that started out so well, as you started spending time with her, or him, or them, it, it brought you to a, not a good place in your life. Maybe you're in a place right now when you're in a crisis of faith. Here's what I've observed over the years. It could be a total collapse. It could be like a few weeks ago when that uh, ship hit the bridge in Maryland. It could be just, a, uh, just a, a complete sudden disaster. But you know what it usually is when we're drifting from God? It's just that. It's a slow fade. It's, it's incremental steps. It's little baby steps. It's, it's her. It's him. It's them. And... Here's the people of God and the faith family and the, and the God that I know and love, the God that called me to himself, and, and I'm having a slow fade. I'm getting farther and farther into the shadows and more and more away from the Lord. So we're going to see next week if that's the case, uh, and I can't wait for you to see what's coming in these next two chapters, but... The Lord does a great work, and, and we'll see that next Sunday. I just want to give four quick applications to this chapter. Number one, God loves to forgive and fully restore all who return to him. Now, we don't see Abram doing that here. We just see a, a pagan king calling him out. But I'm going to go ahead and just give you a little preview. God loves to forgive and fully restore all who return to him. If you're away from God, you come back to him today, he loves to forgive and he loves to restore. Just hear that. Number two, 
we all have frail faith. I don't worry about the person who has seasons of doubt and knows they're weak. You know who I worry about as a pastor? I worry about the person who is unable to acknowledge their own brokenness, who feels that they're good enough on their own. That's who I worry about as a pastor. So if this sermon title, frail, Our Frail Faith and Our Faithful God, if that frail part offended you, or, or maybe you're wondering, well, I wonder, if I'm, I wonder if I've got frail faith. Let me just settle it for you. You do. And the preacher you're listening to does. If the truth be known, oh, I don't care if you've been growing in Christ for years. Our, we are always dependent on the Lord. Our faith is weak. It's frail. Number three, be careful about picking up stones. By that I mean the next time you hear of someone who turned away from God, Maybe this is the, the balance to trying to restore people and bring people back. But the next time you hear about somebody who's had a slow fade or a collapse, just stop to pause and realize that by the, but by the grace of God, there go I. The next time you, you hear about and you want, somebody's gone away from God and you're thinking, how could they have done that? Consider asking yourself, how could I have done some of the things I've done? How could I have made some of the decisions that I've made? Last statement of application. For our frail faith, we do have a faithful God. We have a faithful God. As we prepare in a few minutes to come to the Lord's table, remember what we sang earlier. He will hold me fast. Friends, don't forget that. He will hold me fast. When, my, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. And I love this line. I could never keep my hold. How, how many of you, if you're, if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad I'm holding on to God. I've got a good grip on God. No, God's got a good grip on you. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. Is that not true? Is it not true that our love is often cold? So he must hold me fast. And then the basis for all of it, I, I just love to analyze hymns and, and the words in some songs and this is to me the basis for why everything in this song is true. For my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. That's the gospel. Justice, God's justice, his, his just indignation toward me as a sinner. Christ satisfied that when he died and he ra rose, raised, was raised from the grave. So he will hold me fast. So if you've returned to the Lord after a lapse of faith, I know the old devil likes to come along and say, you should not go to the Lord's table. You've got that little or that big old dark space in your life where you messed up and you've gone away from the Lord. But you've repented. You've sought God's forgiveness. And yet still the devil can get in our heads and say, oh, everybody else is worthy to go pick up a communion tray, but not you. You, you have no business doing it. Friends, listen, the, the Lord's table is an opportunity. It's, it's, it's for spiritual nourishment. It's for mem remembering what Christ did. But this is also for nourishment. Now, obviously, when you look at the size of that cup and cracker, you're going to say, I need a little more than that for lunch. But that's not lunch, but it is nourishment. It, it, there's a spiritual nourishment that comes in taking the Lord's Supper. And one of those ways that we're nourished by it is a reminder of our being loved by Christ and what Christ has done for us. I heard Pastor Ligon Duncan tell this story. I don't think I can tell it as well as he told it, but he 
He told about an old Scottish minister who noticed a young woman in the congregation who was struggling with a lot of guilt over some past decisions in her life. And she was very hesitant to come to the Lord's table. And so the old Scottish pastor, the minister, went to her and said, take it last. That's, a, I guess, a, a, a word for a young woman, a, a Scottish or a Northern Ireland word. Last. Take it last. It's meant for sinners. It's meant for sinners. We, we don't come to the Lord's table because we're perfect. We come because he's a perfect Savior.